Now uh, we have Mr. Neng Singh, and followed by Kenneth and Ellen. Paul will go last. Well, he's not here, so he has to go last. Raymond Wong, would you like to um, join? Yes, please. We haven't reached chapters three and four yet, Ms. Sing Lung Sing. Thank you, Chairman. Apologies, I attended three meetings this morning. Well, um, actually, a, a fourth meeting, but you weren't present, so I I could not attend every meeting. Um, due to the um, incident with Kenneth, um, they um, should have dealt with the issue of hygiene, so I won't repeat myself here. I won't um, talk about the incident here since this is uh, the PAC meeting. And um, on the use and disposal of VSPs, And um, I might have repeated certain points since I went here um, this morning, so please do remind me if that happens. We talked about software and hardware today, and um, software is on the inadequacies of our existing database, and for hardware, we are talking about the, the vacant school premises. There were views that the data are not comprehensive enough. And um, we are yet to identify all VSP. So in terms of both software and hardware, there's room for improvement in our policy. I think the Permanent Secretary or Secretary can address that in a moment on the overall Management. Is there any room for improvement? More importantly, in terms of the data or the database, as we said, there are a lot of inadequacies, and um, computerization is important. We need to um, consolidate the database and enter the data and um, we have to review the data and verify them. So um, all these have to do with manpower. So the integrity of our database is important if we are to know um, the, the usage rates and other statistics relating to the VSPs. Would all of them be surrendered to the government, or would them be put into better uses by NGOs or school sponsoring bodies? So we have to think about the entire utilization of resources. We um, want to put them into gainful uses. This has been covered in 2.7, 2.8. As discussed this morning, 14 schools have not been included on the list of 234 VSPs. So um, the situation is out of control. A lot of them are left undetected, and um, a lot of schools have been left vacant for a very long time. A uh, school has been um, left vacant since 1948, and um, from 1989 to 11, um, the school was left vacated. So, um, for this, well, between 1989 to 2011, we had a lot of vacant premises, but at the same time, were there costs arising from new schools? And during that period, Were there any plans to build new schools? And um, can you share the relevation, relevant information with us this meeting, or can you provide them afterwards? Between 1989 to 2011, can you provide this information? As we mentioned this morning, 
Um, perhaps she can answer the, the issue on the register. Permanent Secretary, thank you very much. From 1989 to 2011, we can provide information on new schools built during that period after the meeting. I'd like to know about the policy or management controls put in place during that period. How can we detect those school premises? This is to do with paragraph 2.8. Um, you were not aware of those 14 VSPs until inquired by the audit. In terms of um, inspections by regional offices, did they make on-site visits? Did they carry out the supervision or inspections? Can you share any um, written records with us so we can see what they have done at that time? Thank you very much. What we can say is those 14 of those 14 VSPs being left out, they came from the school's register. They do not necessarily lead to vacant school premises. As we explained earlier, most VSPs are private schools and um, their premises were not allocated by the government or the EDB. And um, some of them are located in commercial buildings. So um, in response to your question, on public funded schools, the EDB communicates with those schools on a regular basis. We would certainly know if they are deregistered or if their premises are left vacant. But for private schools, since they are not publicly funded upon registration, we would maintain regular communications with them. But the frequencies would be um, would not be as um, close as for public schools. For the 14 VSPs, for the, for the 14 schools, whether or not they would lead to vacant school premises, this is something we have to investigate and we can, uh, we would work with the, the other departments as required. Can you provide the names and addresses for those 14 schools? Please share those information with us. You mentioned private schools. And um, under the former Education and Manpower Bureau, all schools, including private schools, must be inspected. So um, that's why there were the so-called fire drills at that time. So um, as I as I understand, you stopped supervising private schools at a specific point in time. Ng Leung Singh, this morning we reminded the government of the education ordinance. Their responsibilities have been laid out very clearly and their um, scope of responsibility or terms of reference. Perhaps the um, Secretary can address that. Under the education ordinance, all schools must be registered under the EDB. Thank you very much. Yes, he's correct. For private schools, they must be registered as well. What I meant was that compared with public schools, our supervision on well, our supervision of public schools would certainly be more stringent since they are publicly funded. For private schools, we maintain different um, levels of contact with them, as we implement school-based enhancement measures on how they can improve this, the operation. We would put forward recommendations to private schools to encourage them to implement those measures. Thank you very much. Permanent Secretary, a lot of private, a lot of students in private schools are very concerned because they thought you won't, you, you won't care about them. Private schools 
have enormous contributions to Hong Kong's education system, and um, you have to play the role of gatekeeper in terms of quality control. The EDB has a role to play. So um, whether for publicly funded schools or aided schools, you exert more control over them. But for other schools, you have an equal responsibility to communicate with them. I just want to reassure um, you know, viewers who uh, might be concerned. Thank you very much for the clarification. So um, there were doubts that five schools would be ignored as long as they are still under the purview of the Education Bureau, hardware or software-wise or policy-wise, well, this is something we have always been concerned with. So um, we should be fair for vacant private school premises. We should do something about it. Now my um, next question is based on the information shared in 2003. A policy on consolidation of underutilized private uh, primary schools were, was implemented, in, or the, the scrapping of schools, so to speak. A lot of schools were um, scrapped. So for the current VSPs, how many of them um, were scrapped due to the introduction of the consolidation policy in 2003? Permanent Secretary, thank you, Chairman. We are thinking of the relevant information. Well, perhaps I can uh, read out the information and we'll share with them afterwards, starting from 2003 to four. Um, schools with less than 23 students per class would not be given P1 um, places in 2005 to 6. Eight schools were um, ceased operation, and um, and um, we had um, around um, seven schools scrapped in 2000 to 2000, 2010 to 2012. We can share the figures afterwards. These figures are important. Um, from a value for money perspective, we have to see whether um, public resources would uh, are put into good uses. So I hope um, we can receive relevant information at the relevant panel so that we can um, monitor the government so that um, the um, actual execution and monitoring can go hand in hand. Now, I'd like to um, talk about 2.23. The government um, inspected 23 VSPs, and um, those not fit for educational purposes would be surrendered to the EDB. And um, if possible, the ESB would speed up the surrender of VSPs without earmarked uses. So out of the 29 schools, what are your standards to decide whether or not they are um, suitable for surrender? Can you share your standards with us, Permanent Secretary? On whether a VSP is suitable for reprovisioning or decanting, we have to look at the um, geographical conditions of the VSP, its area, its facilities, and um, the um, uses required. In other words, um, the um, schools on the waiting list or time-limited 
primary schools, we have to see where their needs are and whether or not the um, conditions of the VSPs are appropriate. In that case, you consider these factors, and do you have a time frame? Because if you take a long time to consider, then you have to speed up your action. Do you have a timetable to surrender the 25 VSPs? They will supply us with a document. I see. So there's a deadline, right? They will give us a timetable and we will draw the deadline when we follow up. Now, you talked about the regional issue. I'd like to ask uh, now 3.14. Now, the, uh, there are 71 VSPs under Lands Department's purview which were not allocated for any use for and uh, uh, Yunlong, Taipo, uh, 70, uh, and uh, there's 70 percent, that's uh, 70 percent. Uh, now, uh, what are the reasons, can you tell us, for those three districts? Now, the director, now there are 73 VSPs, uh, under lands department which are not earmarked for use. Now um, many of them were village schools so they tend to be distributed in uh, northern new territories and outlying islands and so on. And because they were village schools, because of low enrollment, they were more likely to be closed. Now, on a value for money perspective, now I believe uh, these are the premises that are in uh, more remote areas. Now, have you supplied the information to the Development Bureau to enable them to make better use of the sites? Now, after you take over the sites, what do you do? Uh, do you merely manage the land? But it's the planning department who that puts the sites to use, right? Now, for these 73 VSPs in Para 3.15 that's mentioned, now it's said to be 71 because uh, we are working on two of them. The total is 73, and as of today, there are no existing users. Now, Mr. Ng mentioned that when the uh, Education Bureau has certain VSPs that are no longer for school use, and when the Planning Department uh, finds that certain sites can be used for residential or special purposes, such as clinic purpose, then we would have followed up. So in this table, there are no sites without use, but they... Whom should we chase? Should we chase you or planning department for those 71 VSPs? We must have some timetable in order not to waste resources. Would you be responsible for the 71? Or would it be the planning department, or would it be the financial secretary? Now, these 73 are sites which the planning department have checked and found that there are no suitable long-term users, and so they are turned over to lands department for arrangement. So you don't have to go after lands department. Now, out of the 73, 18, are located in locations where they are, where it's private land with no uh, surrender clauses. Uh, the private uh, 
the lessees uh, has the right to leave the site vacant. Now, some sites uh, have uh, lease conditions that enable them to be used for religious purpose and so on. Now, as for the others, 24 of them, we are already looking at options. Some of them are proposed by government departments for reuse of the VSPs. Some of them are proposed by the district uh, communities. And we are examining such options as small-scale community centers, training centers, or prayer or religious uh, centers or religious or re resource centers and so on. Is this part of your work or is it the GPA, Government Property Agency, or the Secretary for Home Affairs? Because you have to clearly tell us because we need to follow up which department it, would it be under once it's no longer the Education Bureau. You don't have the power to allocate it to who whoever, right? In general, if there's government property that's vacant, normally, according to the government mechanism, it's the department that was using the premises before that would handle it. If it's unable to, then it can get help from GPA. If it's Private land is in the land is in the hand of the private user. Now, education bureau is a large share. Now, many of the school sites were granted to education bureau back then. So, if the education bureau is to identify the users uh, once the land is no longer used for schools. Well, uh, even in 2005, we knew that the in the discussion then that the uh, Education Bureau would have difficulty. So uh, help is sought from elsewhere. So if the uh, so uh, if other people are dealing with it, uh, then starting from 2005, the Lands Department has taken on that role to provide assistance. It's not for the Director of Lands to approve the use for resource center or whatever. Uh, we have a mechanism depending on what's the proposed use, we would identify the department concern. For instance, if someone wants to use a VSP for re religious purpose, then we ask the uh, Home Affairs Bureau to see whether they support such use. And if it's supported, then we would uh, arrange for a short-term lease, or we may turn it over to the Policy Bureau bef uh, for the Bureau to allocate the land. Now, uh, 24 uh, of the private sites are already being dealt with. There are 31 remaining VSPs. Now, how are we dealing with them? 21 of them are in 3.15a. That is, we regularly uh, circulate them to the district council and relevant departments so that uh, with their network, they can uh, indicate to us the possible uses. And then there are 10 more. Uh, in, as referred to in para 3.15c because uh, there is a uh, clause for termination of use and uh, the lands department can uh, retrieve the land according to this term. But out of these 10, I must point out, uh, some of the sites were donated by the villagers back then, and if the government tells them, were to tell them that I will uh, cancel your license, 
Now, it may hurt the villagers' feelings. They may have their own proposals on how to use the land better, and where possible, we'll try to accommodate that. For these leases, are they uh, still in the hands of the government or on the 10 sites in 3.15c, uh, for which we are trying to, on which we are trying to uh, get back the land. Now six of them are on land sites with government license. Now it was uh, very historical. The persons concerned uh, donated the land or they donated the money for the construction, even though it's now government license. Uh, for uh, private land, uh, now because of the consolidation policy, the, the government can rely on the term of the lease. So it's different from the condition of the 18. Yes, those 18 are without that kind of clauses. So even if the uh, lessee leaves the site vacant, it's not an infringement of the lease. Or sometimes the users, uh, there are other users to which the site is put. So 18 of them is entirely turned over to private uh, users for them to do whatever they like. So as for the others, now, so long as the so long as the site uh, is no longer for educational use, then you are handling the sites for the Education Bureau. So you have the uh, powers and the obligations. Is that the case? Yes, the 73 sites are being handled by us. But uh, I hope if you understand if this is private land, then we cannot, in fact, uh, deal with them. If you are so good at resuming land, why don't you resume that land? Now, for government resume, to resume land, it must be for public use. Now, the land is GIC use. Now, it's, the, it's because there's something missing in the lease that the site is left vacant, where it's for public purpose, then you can rely on the resumption ordinance. You have that power. <coughs> if you leave the 18 sites uh, indefinitely, uh, uh, well, I can explain. The GIC site is a planning intent. That's uh, the intent as expressed on the plan. As for what the lease permits, what use is permitted, now sometimes the site, the lease was drawn up before the GIC use was uh, written into the plan. So we have to look at the lease permitted purpose. As for whether the government can use the land resumption ordinance to resume a piece of land. Normally, the government must have a development plan for a whole area, or if the piece of land has to be resumed for a special purpose like hospital, only then. Now, Mr. Ng Leung Singh was asking you that. Uh, are there arrangements already being made with other departments? Allow me to answer. Now, the 73 sites uh, are not uh, earmarked for use yet. Now, if upstream, the planning department has made known that there are certain uses for which the government needs to re recover the land for housing or whatever other purpose, then we must exercise our statutory powder, power to resume the land. We're not talking about the lease, but for these 73 sites, there are no special needs for them to be put to use yet. But these sites are now being wasted. Uh, these are valuable resources. Please go back and give us a report on your action plan. 
That's the way to better use resources. Now you say there are private leases or whatever, but it used to be used for schools, and they, are, they have no use for it. And you have don't you don't have any other uses in mind, so everything would be in limbo. So please actually give report. Please give us the data on how you plan to follow up. Uh, perhaps uh, you can leave someone else to ask questions. Okay, so Kenneth, I'd like to follow up on those um, 73 landlords as well. Um, these 73 landlords have um, suffered from a lot of opportunity loss of opportunity costs and um, for each landlord or VSP would you have um, separate management companies to um, take care of them lands department please or landlords under the lands department whether whether they're vacant or not we would have um, management contractors and um, when we receive complaints, we might even assign a stationed manager, and um, this would be more expensive. So um, generally, we would hire property management contractors to carry out periodic consultants. But these seventy-three lots are not um, valuable; are not generally valuable or beautiful land lots. Or prime landlords, schools in um, urban areas usually won't use these seventy-three lots, and um, they are often located in remote areas, even w without any sort of access or pedestrian paths. How much do you have to pay management costs every year for these seventy three lots and Miss Ling, you said a lot of schools are not accessible, so is this a historical problem? So why do you have schools in areas without access? So how did school children go um go to school? So two questions here, director of the seven of the associated costs associated with these 73 lots, I will um, go back and try to come up with the figures. We don't just look at these 73 um, VSPs, we have um, piecemeal lots as well, but um, I will try to come up with a breakdown whether or not um, and uh, on why these schools were not accessible. I think it was a common issue with village schools they were located in rather remote areas. Ms. Lin mentioned um, 24 VSPs and um, solutions were put forward on how they can be put into use. And um, when you granted the change of use for these 24 VSPs, how long would it usually take? Can you um, tell us the average processing time? Would it be three to four years before it can be granted? Is there any way you can speed up the process? Director? It really um, varies case by case. from the time a formal application is lodged and um, if the case is not too complicated. And that is because the applicant has to prove that um, they are financially capable of running such facility. And um, we need time to consult the relevant policy bureau to Garner their support, so um, the time required for each case is different. Provided that um, 
they can、um, plan and manage the facility. And、um, with the policy bureau's approval, we are talking about、um, short temporary uses, and it takes even shorter for short-term tenancy. So it, we are looking at around one year. But in some cases, the applications lodged are not formal; they are merely expressing an interest, and、um, they are trying to deal with the procedures and the mechanism. So、uh, in those cases, the time requires longer. Kenneth, you said thirty-one other premises are on the list for circulation. They would be circulated in district councils or other government departments, and、um, they can show interest if they want. So, have you considered seriously what to do with those landlords, or are you merely leaving them on the list forever? How long have they been on the list? Have you done any analysis? Can you tell us of the thirty-one VSPs? Have they been on the list for years and years? When were the thirty-one VSPs on the list? Were they added after the autumn report, or、um, what's the number of VSPs that dropped from fifty-five to thirty-one? Of the thirty-one VSPs, well, today we still have thirty-one VSPs without earmarked users or solutions. Of these thirty-one VSPs. Ten of them are、um, in the process of being、um, resumed, and um, and twenty-one、um, are under circulation. Together with、um, those being considered, whether or not circulation is a good approach is、um, really subjective. But on the other hand, if We、um, do not collaborate with other departments for land lots which are not located on prime lots. If we do not rely on anyone, we might not have the network or creativity. And、um, since the practice has been in place for a few years, we we would circulate them with district councils. And、um, they can make use of their networks to、um, maximize the use of such VSPs. And for circulation within government departments, in the past it wasn't very systematic. It was、um, often done on request. But、um, starting from the middle of this year, We started circulating these VSPs with different departments on a proactive basis. Kenneth, now for the other eighteen、um, landlords, they are on private land, and、um, there's no、um, relevant、um, clauses on their、uh, agreements on these. Eighteen sites. Have you negotiated with the landlords? Well, of course, there's some lobbying to be done. Can have you、um, pers persuaded them to、um, surrender the, the sites, or you know, by way of a small、um, compensation? Have you done anything like that? No, we have not done that. If the government asks people to surrender the land, then、um, we should have、um, something earmarked already for those seventy-three sites. We have not come up with earmarked uses, and that's why we have seventy-three sites. However, in the future. If certain government departments want to make use of these private lands, 
apart from instead of recalling the sites, it might be um, better for us to sit down and have further discussions. Kenneth, I have no further questions. Now, I wanted to know whether this is within your terms of reference. Now, your job is to um, secure the best price for each site. If these sites are left vacant, then it's against your responsibility. Now, you are just playing um, the role of um, watchdog, and you are allocating sites as you wish. What are you going to do in the future? Now, well, we don't care about policy. And um, can you go back to um, Paul Chan, the secretary, so um, we can further discuss the matter at the development panel? We cannot leave the, vac the, the sites vacant. This is a policy issue. This is not um, the pur under the purview of the lands department. If this is within your terms of reference, then you are doing a very bad job. Then um, you should be criticized. Some sites have been left vacant for years, so um, you should um, tell the secretary what to do with them. So um, before we draft a report, we want to um, receive an explanation from you on the way forward. We cannot just um, sit here, and uh, we cannot just um, you cannot just leave the site vacant for 20 or 30 years. This is not the way to go in Hong Kong. Okay, thank you very much. Ellen. Thank you, Chairman. Right now, we are looking at um, two to three hundred vacant sites which um, had been earmarked for schools. And um, they have to be dealt with. Having read the audit report, I still don't quite understand the logic. Right now, you have two major categories. One are sites under the purview of EDB. One are surrendered sites under the purview of the Lands Department. Now, for, I have a question for Miss Lin. She categorized the 73 lots into three categories. 18 of them have no um, surrender clauses. They are private lots or private sites. And um, there's nothing in the pipeline for these sites. So are you, are you just going to leave them as is? You said it's best that the government has an idea before um, asking people to surrender the sites. But for these 18 sites, we are not going to do anything about it at this point. You would we, you would be passive. Is that the correct understanding, Miss Lin? As on um, when the government would um, come up with a solution for these 18 sites. Well, there are a few scenarios. First, the government might identify housing um, users, and in such cases, they might um, recall these sites. And second, if um, the land lease is breached or certain conditions are breached, for instance, if the lease specifies that schools must be built, right now, um, they are building a shopping mall. Well, that's just um, an example. Then it's a violation of the land of, of the land lease, and we can um, exercise our power. If any of the above scenarios happen, then the government can take action. Otherwise, they would be treated as other private sites, and they would be dealt with um, according to the lease. So in other words, there's nothing we can do with these 18 sites, and we cannot touch them. And for the 24 sites, you said you already have plans. Do you have a roadmap, Miss Lin? 
主席，诶，每一 No, Chairman. Now, for the timetable of each, I have to go back and take a look one by one. Now, some、uh, do have a timetable、uh, that can come to fruition in a short time.、Uh, some are still subject to technical issues. I hope to give you a report. I hope the director can understand. The public and the council are very concerned. Some of these sites have been uh, left uh, to themselves for decades. We always say that land is short in Hong Kong; it's very precious. But people get the impression that a lot of sites are being left vacant, so it's hard to defend now. The, these sites are under the director of lands to be deployed and arranged for. If someone has a proposal to use the land, do they directly contact you or what? Now, according to our published system, that person would. Contact the district lands officer, and our district land office, our colleagues would handle it for them. And at an appropriate time, they will contact the pertinent policy bureau to get the policy support. So you divide the seventy-three into three main categories. The last category comprises 31 sites, and you say that 21 of them you would circulate to the district council regularly. So for these 31, you have no specific timetable. Now, do you have a wish or desire to for these? Thirty-one sites to be dealt with、uh, to, within a certain period of time. Well, personally, of course, I want these sites to be dealt with、uh, as quickly as possible. But there are objective uh, constraints. Uh, now, for several years, we have regularly circulated these to the district councils and.、Uh, uh, The Home Affairs Bureau and other departments know, but very people have given a definite, expressed definite interest. Now, you are entirely passive right now, right? The director tries to convince us、uh, that this passive is a necessity. Almost has the administration considered this? Some sites. Perhaps due to a lot of geographical constraints, are not very attractive. At least the way they are right now. Have you considered providing some incentives? For instance, a site has an accessibility problem, so you build a flight of steps so that it can be accessed. Do you have such? Policy considerations at lands department. Now, if a if we on whether we should improve the infrastructure of a particular site to make it more attractive, there are a lot of planning studies ongoing. In that process, if that site is included, then. If we're talking about large-scale development of that whole area, we would take that into account. But if sites are not within the scope of such studies, and if the government is going to spend, have to spend money to improve the infrastructure, then that is not a high priority for the government. For instance, if there are development studies for the northeast in New Territories. Then naturally, these sites would fit in. 
three sites are under land department, uh, 71 sites. Out of 71 sites, 24 have now a glimmer of hope. Of course, I don't know where the sun would be seen for these. The director will give us a timetable for the remaining 18 and 31 sites respectively. Out of the 31, 10 are planned for surrendering because there is a surrender clause. Uh, but the others are still being uh, left to waste. So if that's the answer from the Lands Department, we would have to assess on that basis. I don't think it's very satisfactory. When I talk about incentives, of course, I'm not talking about spending tens of millions to make that whole area accessible. Sometimes you can be more flexible. You can spend one or two million dollars and many people will benefit. That is worth considering, probably. Perhaps you can tell us in the document that you supply later. Perhaps you can uh, get some indication from the financial secretary, perhaps. It's not very satisfactory. Only 24 out of 71 uh, are now at a, in a hopeful situation. Also, under the Education Bureau, those VSPs. Now, looking at the audit report, they fall into several categories. Either they are still vacant or they have been allocated uses, but the uses have not been implemented after quite a while. As for the remainder, now there are some users may have been allocated halfway through, then it's the whole this uh, drop, and now uh, on the VSP in Table Five, there are twenty-four under Education Bureau, twenty-nine. Now, eight uh, under four again appear in Table Six. Now, in Table Five, you have set aside for mainstream school use and for temporary school use. There are nine of them. These are not yet earmarked, right? So, you have reserved them, but they are not yet allocated. They are earmarked, but not yet allocated. Can you explain? The secretary. Now, according to this table, let me update this table. Four have already been returned to the government. Four are private land on private land, so it's very complex and a lot of work has to be done. And then there are twelve. Out of these twelve, eight are already being used. That includes short-term uses, for instance, bisessional use for uh, primary schools, uh, primary schools, expansions, and nine are being used for temporary centers. Now, uh, the, uh, and then there's uh, the remaining six for the short-term uses. Now I've seen I've heard the breakdown but on how on the decision for allocation for different uses do you have does the education bureau have a policy on which uses are of greater priority when we look at VSPs to see whether they are suitable for school use we look at a series of factors mainly the location, the area, the transport facilities, accessibility. If it's for reprovisioning of school, then was the original location of the school is the 
VSP is the VSP in the original school location, near the original school. Now we have to write a report. If there, there are policies as the basis for allocating the sites, please let us have a document on that so that we can include that in our report. I also like to ask about Table 6. I believe other members are also interested on the VSPs under EDB's purview. Now, there are eight vacant uh, in South District, Yunlong, and Central. For these eight VSPs, now under Education Bureau policy right now, uh, is there a timetable or is there a set of principles whereby the period of vacancy can be reduced as much as possible? So out of these eight, four have already been returned to the central uh, clearinghouse mechanism, the first four. B, B, C, D, and E. Thank you. As for the remaining four VSPs, they are on private land. We will discuss with the Lands Department on possible ways to deal with them. Now, the PS talks about the the usual mechanism. What's that mechanism? That is, if the VSPs are not suitable for education use, that is, if they are not school suitable for school and other educational use, then under existing mechanism, we would uh, let the lands department and planning department look at whether they are suitable for other uses. BCDE, are they now at planning department or are they already under lands department? Now, the director already mentioned this mechanism. The notice has been given to lands department and planning department. They have been surrendered over the past few months, not within the set 73. So uh, the director will see whether they are suitable users, and some are on private land. They are already in those uses. So the two departments will look at them again. So. They have come under the mechanism in the, during the past few months, so they are still with planning department. And it's for other departments to express their interest, right? No, the understanding is that the sites are returned to the lands department, and then the lands department would ask the planning department to see other departments are interested. That's not my understanding. <coughs> my understanding is that they go to the planning department first. The planning department has not appeared in the discussion. Now, when the Education Bureau believes that the sites do not have to be for school use, then it would notify the planning department and the lands department at the same time. Now, this happened only past, during the past few months, and then planning department would give an opinion for these four sites on private land, whether they are suitable for large-scale, long-term development use. We are talking about BCDE, not private land. The PS said that FGHI are no BCDE are also private land, so planning department has no obligation because you must be clear. You have this power; they don't. They only have the. Uh, they are only users. So who controls these four? The education bureau said they have passed it over. Now, who are they with? They are private land. They are uh, in the hands of the lessee. Planning department will give 
an opinion on whether the government can use these four sites. For these private sites, can they be recovered, resumed, or is there a condition for the land to be returned once they are not used for schools? I understand. For these four sites, it's similar to um, what I talked about. Three of these four sites um, have no um, clause on uh, cessation of school operation. And um, the allowed users are rather flexible. They can use for purposes other from schools. There are no restrictions. If um, that's the case, if such condition exists, why can the EDB um, be in possession for um, of so many sites? Do you do you see what I mean? Why um, can the EDB um, be in possession of so many vacant sites if they don't need it anyway? They are standing in the way of private possession. Well, under the basic law, um, the private assets are safeguarded. But right now, you are. Um, in possession of such sites, so you have to elaborate this very clearly, Chairman. All along, we have been um, discussing the surround of sites to you. So um, this is merely a a concept or a plan. The word surrender means that um, the um, the site does not have to be allo allocated by the Education Bureau anymore. That's what it, uh, what it means by surrendering, but it doesn't mean that sur surrendered sites belong to the Education Bureau. The relevant landlords still have the right to their own assets. Um, the entire audit report hinges on whether um, the schools still require or need these premises. Of course, they need it because the, they still process um, possess the land. For the first four sites, um, the vacancy periods range from six to ten years. So, um, is this a case of abuse of power? If there's private possession. You are standing in the way, and they cannot do whatever they want. So, uh, from an administrative point of view, we have to supervise or um, watch over the situation. That's the job of the PAC. This is not merely a concept. We are talking about laws and ordinances and powers. If that's the case, we have to um, relay the messages to the different panels. This is not merely a concept. And um, this is to deal with rights and powers. Right now, um, the vacancy periods are up to um, 10 years. If I'm the landlord, I'm going to sue you for sure. Chairman, these vacancy periods of 9 years or 10.6 years um, do not refer to. Um, the period of possession by the government. Um, th these periods refer to um, the dates in which um, operation has been ceased. As Ms. Ling said, the database refers to the year in which the school has ceased operation, and um, it's not no longer in educational use. And um, but for private land. They are allowed to um, do whatever they want um, under the lease conditions. In a lot of these sites, school sponsoring bodies would follow the lease conditions and um, continue with educational uses. In some cases, some modifications or waivers would be applied. So um, we uh, we have not been holding up any private sites or, or stop them from um, putting them into whatever use. Ellen, in Table Six. They had not been earmarked for any use. Director of Audit, can you help, please? They have been left vacant. 
Thank you, Chairman. For School B, the time elapsed is six is ten point six years. It refers to the time left since cessation of school operation, and the EDB is no longer following up. And um, School B has a um, clause and clause in place for surrendering. So um, that's what happens. These sites have been left vacant. We are not saying that the EDB is in possession of such sites or sealing of those sites. Basically, it means that the EDB has, has not been doing anything. For School B, it has ceased operation more than 10 years ago, and something has to be done. You should, um, It should be surrendered to the EDB. So who should manage them? And um, the EDB should first, as, first assess whether um, there's educational needs, but it's private land. There's a surrender clause upon cessation of school operation. Um, I, I'm not very familiar, so please excuse me. Some members might be familiar. Chairman, this is rather complicated. If it's not as complicated, then um, the um, situation would be much clearer. I'm not sure which witnesses could um, lend a helping hand. Upon cessation of operation, well, of course, some schools were located on private land. Some have um, surrendered clauses in place in case of cessation of operations. Some are located on non-private land. Of course, the ideal scenario is that um, you have a flowchart in place to illustrate the, the different steps along the way. So at this stage of evidence taking, it's rather confusing. When um, a school ceases operation, were any um, surrender clauses in place at any point of the um, in history, and um, then we can see which departments should be responsible. And um, whether there, there's any um, breach of private these conditions. Right now, the situation is very unclear. So, um, can I say that? Well, for the director of lands, can the director of lands explain um, the string of procedures? So, for for school B. 23,000 square feet. It's a big site. It's been left vacant for 10 years. So what's the flow chart for this school? Chairman, for schools B, C, D, and E. We only learned from the EDB recently that um, they no longer want to um, think about how to relocate um, premises on private lots for these four schools. They have always been on private land, and um, the grantee has to use the lot um, according to the lease conditions if. Um, there's no stipulation that it must be used for a school. They can use it for other purposes, as uh, mentioned by the land lease. For school B, according to our records, we just received information from the EDB. We actually granted a lease modification application a few years ago. Is this 
St. Peter's School. This school is located in Shek O. Uh, please go on. So um, they already modified the land lease, and um, they want to convert it into a resident facility. So for School B, the grantee of the private land is already doing work as per the lease conditions for C, D, and E. All we know is that the premise is currently vacant and um, the grantee is not doing anything in specific there. And according to the land lease, the use is versatile and um, there are no restrictions. And um, there is no surrender clauses. So um, it's in the hand of the grantee. So 10 years ago at School C, well, it has been vacant since 10 years ago. It's in the hands of the Education Bureau. At that time, the Education Bureau had not notified us of this VSP. Recently, they have informed us, and as such, we will look into that with the planning department. The, um, the actual physical possession is in the hands of the, the private landlord or the, the landlord. Whether um, the Education Bureau would work with the um, grantee, well, there were there might have been such considerations in the past, but now um, the Education Bureau had notified the um, Planning Department and Lands Department that they uh, would no longer consider these um, sites for education purposes, but the ownership has n never changed. Permanent Secretary, is there anything you want to speak on School C? Can you help us explain, this, um, understand the situation? For School B, the landlord has already taken action. What about for School B, School C? Is there any information on hand? If not, please come back to us later on that. Um, that's one of the um, sites surrendered. So, what about before the surrender? Miss Lin said you recently surrendered the site to them, and um, before that, you were in possession of the land, and it was private land. So, um, within over the last ten years and six months, what happened? And um, we need to know that how much money has been spent on um, maintenance and um, supervising and operation, etc. of this school. Chairman, this school is on private land. As we discussed with the Audit Commission, we understood that um, we only have the date of cessation in our database, and the Audit Commission would look at their situation as of the 30th of April. And um, since it's on private land, with whether the grantee has used the site for other purpose, for non-school purposes, it's something we don't know. And um, the grantee would conduct the work themselves because it's on private land. If they are in possession, then they have to maintain it. How can they pass on the possession or ownership to someone else, Miss? Lin, um, in Annex 7 of the audit report, the so-called surrendering uh, arrangement means that the Education Bureau has decided that it um, no longer has to be um, allocated for education purposes. It doesn't mean um, we owe the key, so to speak, to the premises. So um, the meeting would must end at 1 p.m. What about for School D in um, Central and Western District? Ms. Lin? Well, perhaps I can talk about School E first. I'm more familiar with this school. That school has different arrangements for international schools and kindergarten. For School E, which school is it? According to the footnotes, 
it's a school in Wan Chai. I want to stress that it has not been left vacant. The time lapse is 6.6. .6. For around 4.8 years, it was put into temporary use. That's all I want to say. Raymond, um, um, so perhaps you can um, wait for, uh, well, wait till next time because the meeting must end at 1 p.m. As Mr. Lung said, can you um, give us a flowchart so we can understand the situation? Very often they have been left vacant, but um, perhaps it's not always the case. So um, please um, share a flowchart with us so we can understand better. So it's um, 1 p.m. Miss Lin um, should um, do the work. Are you going to make her do the work? But the Education Bureau is the um, bureau to be audited. Miss Lin is in the best position. Well, of course, you can say no, Miss Lin. She had um, a lot of experience with education, and um, she has a lot of sense and experience. So um, please give us a hand. In Annex B, Annex 6, um, there's a summary or overview. There might not be a lot of details, however. Um, we are not thinking about Annex B. We want to know um, the details of these cases. Yes, we see that. But um, we are still unclear on a lot of these cases. So, um, Paul, please wait for the please wait till the next meeting. My apologies. Annex B is not enough. I know. So um, we that's why we asked for a flowchart. Annex B is incomplete. That's why we need a flowchart. I think um, they have to fill in the gaps. Paul, um, let's wait till Raymond. You go first next time. Now um, let's um, find another time for the next meeting. It's we are looking at a complicated issue. Secretary, um, personally, I haven't um, quite grasped the situation, and a lot of the concepts are still rather muddy. All right, thank you very much. Thank you, David, and uh, your colleagues.